Good afternoon. Welcome back in the EOD After Brexit show. I have the pleasure of welcoming Juan Pablo Rojas. Hello, how are you? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm fine. Student in International and Reopen Law. Uh, to explain this, the effects of the Brexit on the Dublin Free Regulation and on the asylum situation. Indeed. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Juan, um, could you explain to us what is the Dublin Free Regulation? Right. So, first of all, the Dublin Three Regulation is a piece of EU legislation. It is a regulation which means that it is immediately enforceable simultaneously on all member states. Uh, specifically, the Dublin Three uh, Regulation contains all the rev relevant criteria and mechanisms um, to determine which member state is responsible for all um, the examination of all uh, asylum applications. Um, this includes all EU member states as well as Iceland, Norway, Switzerland and Liechtenstein. And so the key feature, one of the key features of this regulation is the take back, take back scheme. Um, Basically, when a member state fits the criteria of a responsible uh, member state, then it, it is uh, eligible for this take-back scheme. And criteria can include uh, family reunification, um, being in possession of a visa, as well as irregular stay and irregular entry. And this, this last one, irregular stay and irregular entry, is one of the most common criteria which are used for the take-back scheme. Um, so this happens when the member state through which the applicant first enters the European Union, uh, this uh, member state is the one responsible. So I can give you an example. For example, mm -hmm. if uh, an asylum seeker arrives in France and uh, applies for asylum in, in France, but then it can be proven that this asylum seeker first entered EU territory in Greece, mm -hmm. then, the, then, the, then France can solicit this uh, take back request. To, to Greece and send the individual back to Greece. Now, as you can probably tell, this benefits member states with, um, without, who do not have borders with third countries, as well as uh, member states that don't, uh, are, don't have borders with major uh, sea routes, such as the Mediterranean. Um, another feature of this regulation is the take charge, which is when one member state requests another to um, take responsibility for the application of a member of an asylum seeker. So this is very common in the context of family reunification. And yeah, in a nutshell, that is the Dublin Three regulation. And how does the Brexit affect the Dublin Three regulation? So with Brexit, the United Kingdom will no longer form part of the common European asylum mm -hmm. system. And this includes all relevant asylum EU legislation, such as Dublin Three regulation and other um, other um, uh, legislation which is relevant in this field. So this means that the UK can no longer participate in either the take charge or take back schemes. Um, did the UK gain any advantages from participating in the Dublin Free Regulation? So the Dublin Free Regulation was very advant advantageous for the UK. And Let's remember again that Brexit, a big part of Brexit was for the United Kingdom to take back control of the borders. Um, but ironically, leaving Dublin 3 increases the ease in which applicants can enter the United Kingdom and stay. And this is because of various reasons. For example, the geographical uh, context of the United Kingdom. As we all know, the United Kingdom is an island in the northwest of Europe isolated from the rest of the continent and from other parts of the world where a lot of asylum seekers are coming from. So s with Dublin 3, when, before Brexit, it was difficult for an asylum seeker to effectively have an, a legal procedure mm -hmm. in which uh, they could apply for asylum in the UK due to the fact that they would have to enter other member states um, first before reaching the UK, such as France or Belgium, Spain, Greece, Italy, etc. Um, and now more than ever, this is very relevant because in the past few years, we've seen an increase of uh, so-called uh, channel crossings, mm. uh, where individuals are crossing uh, the English Channel from either Belgium, the Netherlands, or France to the UK seeking asylum. Um, back when uh, the UK belonged to the Dublin Three uh, system, uh, it was a simple procedure for them to send back any asylum seeker which they... Uh, did not want to uh, 
uh, did not want to process because of this uh, take back scheme. But now, after Brexit, there is no legal responsibility for any member state to take back any asylum seeker due to the fact that simply they're not part of Dublin 3 anymore. And I do believe that this could increase tensions between the UK and the European Union because now EU member states might allow uh, asylum seekers to go through their territory and uh, allow them to reach the United Kingdom because they know that there is no real consequence. Yeah, but can you explain this more? Uh, how will Brexit affect the asylum seekers themselves? Right, so again, um, I think it's important to remember that a large part of the Brexit campaign, especially the Leave campaign, was centered a lot on asylum and immigration in general. In fact, it is difficult to forget uh, the large poster that Nigel Farage had in uh, a week before the referendum, which uh, uh, contained uh, pictures of Syrian refugees and with the caption saying the EU has failed us. So it's definitely a very uh, hot topic, you can say. And even today, it remains so, even after Brexit. A few months ago, the, U the UK Home Secretary, Priti Patel, insisted that uh, activist lawyers, as she called them, are frustrating the Home Office in, in when they're trying to uh, deport asylum seekers. So it is a very mm, hostile environment for asylum seekers right now, I think, especially after Brexit. The common European asylum system of the European Union is far from perfect, but I do believe that it nevertheless aims to establish minimum standards for the applicants and minimum standard of rights for a lot of uh, vulnerable people. For example, those who are unaccompanied minors, uh, victims of uh, sexual violence, as well as people with disabilities. Now, in the UK, these sort of minimum guarantees after Brexit uh, no longer apply. And it's very uncertain what sort of uh, special rights uh, these uh, vulnerable people will have after Brexit. Um, one example is that there is a st now there's a stricter requirements on family re reunification, which is a key feature of Dublin 3. Uh, for example, a spouse or a, a child of a person who's residing in the UK before Brexit were able to easily uh, join their family member in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. As well with unaccompanied minors, if they had a parent, an uncle, grandparent, or an aunt living in the UK, they could easily uh, go to the United Kingdom after uh, uh, to, re to have this uh, family unification scheme. But now, after Brexit, this is so much more difficult. And um, we'll see how it goes. Obviously, the UK still remains part of the 1951 Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees, which does uh, impose some minimum standards, such as the principle of non-refoulement. But nevertheless, I do think that a lot of asylum seekers remain at risk. Mm, I see. And um, the EU and UK signed an agreement, the Treaty on Cooperation and Agreement. Uh, what does this treaty provide for the asylum seekers? Right, so the EU signed uh, with the UK the trade and cooperate, the so-called trade and cooperation agreement on the 30th of December 2020, right before the end of the transition period. But uh, this agreement is mostly an economic agreement relating to trade and uh, fishing rights, these sort of things, and it does not touch at all upon not asylum. At all. Not at all. And so the UK government did not wish to replicate the Dublin Three Agreement. Uh, like they did not want to have a copy paste of the of the of the regulation with the European Union, but instead they did want to cherry pick some provisions that are included in this um, in this regulation. And they did propose to the European Union some draft agreements, for example, on the transfer of unaccompanied minors, mm -hmm. as well as the return of irregular third country uh, individuals staying in the UK. So you could see that the UK did recognize that um, Dublin 3 did provide them with some advantages. But of course, the European Union uh, rejected these draft agreements and these proposals. And I think the future really remains uncertain. I think overall, um, the European Union and the UK must continue to cooperate in this field of asylum in order to not only guarantee the rights of their own citizens, but also to guarantee the rights of thousands of people who are uh, traveling to the, to the European Union and to the UK looking for a, a better life. Thank you. We will end with, uh, with this last word, Better Life. Um, thank you for coming and for bringing your expertise on such huge topic. Uh, do not hesitate from home to uh, find our other episode on our channel. Thank you for following us.